I just want to say, wow, about the book of Micah. That's what I think about it. I have really enjoyed studying the book of Micah, and I thank you for studying it with me. This little book has been packed with big prophecies and so many. Of all the different books of the Bible that I have written Bible studies on, Micah was the least familiar to me. I really had no exposure to it before. It was not on my own list of Bible books to write a study on, so it came as a surprise. And my view now is that it is a very overlooked book, and it's one that believers need to, need to spend more time in. I've also found that understanding Micah's prophecies leads to a greater understanding of the book of Isaiah. So if you're wondering what to do with yourself now after Micah, just start reading Isaiah on your own and then come back for Ezekiel in August. You had a bit of review of Micah in your homework lessons. And I think it's very encouraging to read how others summarize the book after studying it for yourself. Because then you know for yourself the background, the truths, the verses, the structure of the book. You know what's in the book and you know what the foundation is of these summaries. I was just looking at what is in my Bible here, the Thomas Nelson Study Bible. And it says Old Testament prophets are often thought of as providing not much more than do. But the book of Micah presents an impassioned and artistic interplay, would you agree with that, uh, between oracles of impending judgment and promises of future blessing on Israel and Judah. The peoples of both nations had broken covenant with their Lord. Through his messenger Micah, the Lord confronted his people, but he also promised to bring future blessing through the one who would be coming. This one would be the true shepherd of God's flock. So they didn't just say that just for fun, that he'd be the shepherd of God's flock. We're told that Jesus will shepherd the flock. So I'm going to share a few more introductions of Micah with you, and I hope that they will make sense and ring bells, and you'll just think about what you have studied, and we'll review some of the verses, and you'll have a summary, and this will bring us to the final verses that we studied this week as well. So, Exploring Bible Prophecy commentary book says, one of Micah's interests was the poor and oppressed people of Judah, but his principal emphasis, like that of Isaiah, was to warn of punishment for sin if the nation did not repent. Micah predicted the destruction of the northern kingdom, right? Northern kingdom, Samaria, and then used this as a stern illustration of what could happen to Judah, the southern kingdom. And he named all those cities in his wordplay. How did the prophecies through Micah begin? Well, this is the first thing that we're going to think about. Micah 1.1, the word of the Lord that came to Micah of Morsheth was, Hear, all you peoples, listen, O earth, and all in it. Let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. So the book of Micah is a book of the word of the Lord. Everything is what the Lord communicated through Micah. There were declarations. There were judgments. There are promises. Everything the Lord said through Micah is true and trustworthy because it's the word of the Lord. It's true and trustworthy. We studied, these are the beginning words, and we studied the last words of the Lord through Micah. The last words are beautiful and comforting and amazing as he promises to pardon sin and pass over rebellion. But we don't know how critical and how meaningful those promises of pardoning sin are, unless we recognize how disastrous sin is. 
The whole book of Micah makes it clear that the consequences of sin are horrible. And that's why the grace and mercy is so amazing to rescue. Sin is unrestrained and excessive, but God's justice and mercy are limitless and extravagant. The New American Commentary says this about Micah. It appears to have a threefold purpose. First, to present the nature of God's complaint against his covenant people. Second, to proclaim the Lord's certain punishment of their many sins. And third, to predict God's sure salvation to come, centering in the appearance of the Davidic messianic deliverer. So three purposes. God's complaint, his punishment, and then his sure salvation, which will come through the deliverer. The Lord had sent Micah, who said, But as for me, I am filled with power by the Spirit of the Lord, with justice and courage to proclaim to Jacob his rebellion and to Israel his sin. And Micah did that. He obeyed the Lord and proclaimed the sins of Israel. Do you remember this about God's complaint and his punishment from Micah 2, 8 through 10? Recently, my people have risen up like an enemy. You strip off the splendid robe from those who are passing through confidently, like those returning from war. You force the women of my people out of their comfortable homes, and you take my blessing from their children forever. Get up and leave, for this is not your place of because defilement brings destruction, a grievous destruction. That is describing the oppression of the people of Israel. And God says, get up and leave. Arise and go. You can't stay here. Destruction is coming to the land because of your sin. I also hope that you remember what we discovered about the deliverer, who you can now call the breaker. Jesus is the breaker. The word of the Lord guarantees he is coming. Micah 2, 12 and 13, 12 says, I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep in the fold, like a flock in the midst of its pasture. They will be noisy with men. And so we discovered that perhaps they will be gathered together in Petra. And this is a picture of Petra, the Seek entering the narrow entryway into the area in the mountains. And verse 13, the breaker goes up before them. They break out, pass through the gate, and go out by it. So their king goes on before them and the Lord at their head. The breaker is the king. He is the Lord. This is Jesus. We spent several weeks learning about the Messiah's deliverance of Israel and the result of that deliverance. And that's a magnificent day that is on the horizon when Jesus comes and delivers and then the result, the impact, the change in the world because of the change that happens to Israel. This will be in the Akarit Hayamim, in the last days. Beautiful blessings will come when Israel turns to Jesus as their Messiah and knows Jesus as their Savior and their King. He's the one that Micah prophesied in chapter 5, who would be born in Bethlehem. Jesus was no ordinary baby boy, as this verse tells us, but he's one whose origin is from of old, from ancient of days. Micah spoke of he cannot truly comprehend that a baby born of flesh and blood would be Born but his origin is from Kadem to Olam. Do you remember those words? It is from eternity past to eternity future. And this phrase put together tells us that. So it tells us this man, Jesus, the baby born, is not a brand new life, but he is eternal. Jesus is God. We saw the deity of God, Jesus and he is the one who will return to earth and reign as the perfect, just ruler 
over Israel and the world. We call that time the Millennial Kingdom, the Thousand Year Reign. It's also called the Messianic Kingdom. That's what the Jews called it before we started calling it the Millennial They probably still call it the Messianic Kingdom. We call it the Millennial Kingdom because of Revelation where it says a thousand years, and that's the word millennial. So we could call it both of these things because the Messiah will be reigning. And we spent time in Micah chapter 4 and 5, which describe this glorious time on earth. Micah 4, 1 says, It shall come to pass in the latter days. The mountain of the Lord's house will be established at the top of the mountains. And it will be raised above the hills and people will flow to it. Many nations shall say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and shall decide for strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken this. In your homework this week, I asked you the question, what is your favorite aspect of the future kingdom under the reign of Jesus, the king? And I love this prophecy from Micah 4, 1, that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be lifted up and peoples will it. I love the vivid picture that's painted here. I love that the topography of Jerusalem is going to change and reflect the glory of our great God. Mount Zion, the home of the Lord, will be the highest and the greatest mountain. But what's really communicated through this prophecy is that the Lord God, our splendid and majestic and loving God, will be worshipped by people from all over the world. All will worship him as he deserves. That time is coming. Well, I have a review of some of the characteristics of the Messianic kingdom. When Jesus reigns from the throne of David in Jerusalem, that Messianic kingdom, Jesus reigns from the throne of David. When he reigns, he will shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they, Israel, shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. That's a promise. And while he's reigning, shepherding, the millennial temple will be on a plateau on top of Mount Zion, with the temple grounds being approximately one mile by one mile square. That's a huge complex, compound, place of worship for so many people to come. Jerusalem will be a place of instruction of the ways of God for the entire world. Peace will be universal. Israel will have great prosperity that's indicated in Micah 4.4 4 with the imagery of every man sitting under his vine and his fig tree. And I hope that phrase will ring bells as you hear it every now and then. And you will know that it's talking of prosperity, abundance, the blessing on the land, the fruitfulness of the land. This is what God is going to give his people, Israel. All the tribes of Israel will be regathered. This promise is made repeatedly throughout Micah and the other prophets. And what a critical prophecy it is. Because Israel has known exile and dispersion and persecution and destruction. But this promise tells us that God saves a remnant. Israel still knows persecution today anti-Semitism. People want to do away with them. But the remnant will be regathered to the specific territory in the Middle East that God promised to Abraham 
And when Israel is regathered, and tr when Israel trusts in Jesus as their Messiah, Micah promises that, according to Micah 5, 7, the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass. And that's why we have this last statement that Israel will be a blessing to the world. They will be like dew from the Lord, showers on the grass. Those are blessings from the Lord. Israel will be a blessing to the world. It already has been, right? It was through the nation of Israel that we received the word of the Lord and the recording of the scriptures. This book that we have in our hand is a Jewish book. <laughs> and through the nation of Israel, we receive Jesus, our Savior. Another summary of the book of Micah from the Holman Old Testament commentary is given as a list of what you find in this minor prophet. He uses the language of lament to show the dire nature of the situation. Micah cried. He said he would mourn like the sound of an ostrich. He accused people of insincere religion and an unjust economic and political system. We saw injustice throughout our study of this book. Micah attacked false prophets. He used courtroom language to convict Judah and Israel of their sins and to sentence them to exile and destruction. Micah defended God as having done every good thing possible for the nation. And he listed God's requirement of doing justice, loving mercy, hesed. This is covenant faithfulness. And God's requirement is walking humbly with him. That's walking with wisdom and care. Through Micah, we are reminded how good, that phrase is matov, how good the words of the Lord are for us. Micah 2.7, the Lord said, Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? And if you didn't already know Micah 6.8 very well, you know it. Very well now, he has told you, O oh, men and women, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to justice and to love hesed, mercy, kindness, loving kindness, faithful love, loyal love, and to walk humbly with your God. I hope that we have all learned a lot about justice the justice of our God through this study. The leaders of Israel who were supposed to know justice totally perverted it. Micah said, listen, you rulers of the nation of Israel, you ought to know what is just, yet you hate what is good and you love what is evil. And that is still a definition of injustice today. But God loves justice. The foundation of his throne is righteousness and justice. He loves good. He hates evil. All God's justice, justice involves his decisions. All of his justice, which is the word mishpat, referring to his commandments, his instructions, all are based on the greatest commandments of all. The first one, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second great commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the basis of justice, these two commandments. This is the basis of doing what is good and right and merciful and walking humbly with your God. And that's a review of much of the book of Micah. As we read the concluding words of Judgment and Promise in chapter 7, we saw Micah's response to all of it. He said in Micah 7, 7, But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. This picture has Jerusalem with the sun shining down on it. And the sheep 
you know, the stupid sheep who need a shepherd. The last verses of Micah explained the great promise and the great hope that Micah would wait for. And Micah expressed the last prophecy of the Lord. He expressed it with adoration, with amazement. Who is a God like you? He probably stopped and just thought about that question for a moment. But we see what else he had to say. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights steadfast love. Steadfast love, right there, that, those two words are the one word hesed. Some of your translations would say mercy. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. And then cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. God is going to keep his promise that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the nation of Israel. He made a promise to them. So this passage, these three verses, are God's response to sin. Wow. Who is a God like our God? He saw every sinful action and attitude of every Israelite, and he sees every sinful action and attitude of every individual on the earth today. His offer of forgiveness and salvation is available for everyone. But sin must be recognized. Sin is iniquity. And this word in Hebrew is awan. And it has the root meaning of something that is twisted or distorted. So iniquity refers to thoughts and actions, thoughts and behaviors that deviate from God's ways, from God's design. Anything that twists and distorts what God intends, what God has declared as the way things are and are to be. Sin is transgression, and this word in Hebrew is pesha. And the root meaning is rebellion and revolt, a breach in relationship. This word refers to rejection of God's authority. Every sin is iniquity and transgression. You don't need to categorize sins into one bucket or another. They're all wrong. They're all bad. They are all iniquity and transgression, rebellion. Any thought, any action, any behavior that goes against God's design and God's instruction is a twisted, distorted rebellion against God. That's gross. And every one of us has committed gross sin. So now... Take out in your hands those pieces of paper with some, uh, some gross sins that are written on them. These were handed out to you randomly. You may have some sins that you have not actually committed that are on these papers. But James 2.10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. This is gross. This is heavy. This is disgusting. So consider these sins that you have in your hands. Are you sickened by them? Are you grieved and burdened by them? Do you want to get them out of your hands? Praise God that he made the way. And that's what the promise of Micah 7, 18 through 20 celebrates. Again, Micah 7, 18, well, verse 19 says, He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Let's think about that for a minute. Picture it. God in Christ stomped on. He crushed the iniquities 
he crushed all our rebellion. And that's what has to happen to rebellion. Rebellion has to be put down. It has to be crushed. Isaiah 53, 6 and 7 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. During Jesus' death on the cross, God placed all our iniquity on him and placed all of his wrath on us our iniquity on Jesus. That is the substitutionary atonement. Jesus took our place. God placed all of our iniquity, all of these gross sins, all of them were placed on Jesus. He bore the burden. And God placed all of his wrath towards these sins. On Jesus, he bore the wrath for our sins. Because God did this, he does not retain his anger forever, and he delights in acting in mercy. Micah 7, 19 is a promise and a celebration. It says, you will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You read in your workbooks that Micah 7, 18 through 20 is read every year on the afternoon of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. That's so appropriate. But 10 days before that is the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah. And it begins the, the 10 days of this very special high holy days. Rosh Hashanah, celebration, 10 days later, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. This New Year, Rosh Hashanah is a day of worship, repentance, and hope. That day, some Jewish families spend time at a body of water, at an ocean, a lake, a stream, and they observe a celebration that is called Tashlik. That word Tashlik is what's underlined in Micah 7, 19. You will cast. Tashlik is cast. You will cast. It's a verb. That's a new word to me, but I like it very much. <laughs> It means to throw, to cast, to hurl. And God's total forgiveness of sin is graphically portrayed here when God casts the sins of his people into the depths of the sea. And this tells us they're gone forever, never to be brought up again to the light of day. With both of Micah's illustrations, they are his vivid word pictures, we can imagine God and Christ crushing our iniquities under his feet and then picking them up. It's crushed and then it's picked up and hurled into the far depths of the sea. God is powerful, so his arm, I mean, he's got a good arm. <laughs> he, can, he can put them way out there. Our sins are gross and many and heavy. They're too heavy for us. We can't pick them up. We can't throw them. We can't crush them and then pick them up and throw them. But with God's mighty power, he did crush them. And he does hurl them away from us forever. And so we say hallelujah <laughs> about that. The Jews go to the water to celebrate Tashlik and to illustrate God casting all of their sins into the depths of the sea. And there are various ways that they do this. They throw breadcrumbs or pebbles or they might empty their pockets and whatever lint and stuff's in their pockets, they toss that into the water. Obviously the bread, the pebbles, the lint represents the sins that, and the, they represent for the Jews the sins of the past year. So they're doing this on their New Year's Day, and they consider that they are forgiven and those sins are forgotten. And that's God's promise, that he will forgive and forget and do away with those sins, not hold them against us. His promise is fulfilled when someone trusts in Jesus as their Savior. So today, now, with these little pieces of paper, I want you to be able to celebrate the grace 
and the chesed, the justice and mercy of God. And I invite you to do what God does with his sin. So take out these pieces of paper and I'm going to um, tell you what to do with them. You're going to have a moment, a minute of prayer of confessing your sin and praising God for forgiveness of sin. What these may be, you, know, you may have some sins on here that you've committed that you want to say, uh, ask for forgiveness for and praise him for salvation. But I also want you to, I also want to encourage you to pray for someone else. Maybe someone you don't even know. Someone who needs forgiveness for these sins because they're an unbeliever and they are under the burden of this sin and their life is sick with sin. They may not even know it. And after your prayer time, then you're going to crush it up and um, I will call you up row by row and you can hurl those crushed forgiven sins into the depths of this baby pool <laughs> that you're going to imagine is the Mariana Trench, the deepest part of the ocean. When we do that, since I can't take you to the ocean, which I wanted to do, I'm going to play a music video which is recorded in Israel at the Sea of Galilee. And the song that they will be singing is entitled Hallelujah. It's in Hebrew and you'll recognize Hallelujah. But the first words of the song are Mi Komoka, which is who is like God. It begins with what Micah says. Jesus, we thank you for bearing the weight of sin and providing a way for us to be forgiven for our sin. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I think that job is done. All right. Well, that is praise to God for what he has done, right? Hallelujah. Yes. I'll just stop it right there. Micah, whose name means who is like Yahweh, has shown us that there is no one like him. And Micah has shown us that he is a God of justice and mercy. I want you to say hallelujah for that. It's not a contradiction. What a blessing God's justice and mercy are for us. It has saved us. Let's pray. Lord God, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We do praise you for all that you are, all of your glory, all of your love, all of your justice. There is no conflict in you. Thank you for giving us your son, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for taking our sins upon yourself and for rising from the dead that we too one day will rise to be with you forever. And we praise you for the promises that you're going to keep to Israel and show the glory, the greatness of your nature and your faithfulness to your word and your defeat of all evil. We, with Micah, will look to you, the God of our salvation. We will wait with hope and anticipation for your promises to be fulfilled. We thank you that you are our God right here and now. We praise you for your Holy Spirit for strength for today, for courage for today, for the forgiveness that we enjoy today, for the freedom that we have to walk with you, to walk humbly with you. So we praise you, our God. We praise you for the fellowship of this community and the time that we've had together studying your words through Micah, this book. We love you, O Lord, our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>